So I'll let, I'll let uh, Ryan and Doug moderate any questions because some reason my, my chat box isn't popping up. But um, so, so as Ryan mentioned, so our goals here are going to be a little bit different than the typical stuff we've done before. And so we're not, uh, you know, going to try to go through all the, all the pathology and, uh, and everything from that regard. We're really going to just try to do like a practical case and focus on maybe a few relevant things from that individual case but really try to put it in the context of how you're going to approach this in the clinic. So start with the referral and then, uh, you know, how do you set up your protocol? What I do for my protocol for this particular problem? And then particularly in how do you then convey that information uh, to your colleagues? And so, so how do you actually write the report? I think this is one of the hardest things for people to do when they move from, uh, you know, from, from getting, good at scanning and then recognizing pathology, and then you have to describe what you're seeing, and that's often the hardest thing to do. Uh, and so I think that's what we really wanna to try to accomplish with, uh, with some of these talks is sort of, sort of uh, helping everybody along that pathway. Uh, and the other thing to say too is, is there's probably more than one right way to do this, right? And so, um, so people may have different scanning protocols that they use, that's fine, um, you know, and share those. Um, you know, I think we can all learn together with this. There's probably different ways that that people um, do imaging reports. And so you all see that you know, when you get different uh, radiology reports back for your own clinic. And so there's, uh, you know, th this, is, this is the way I do it. It's not necessarily the way you have to do it. And we can maybe have some good discussion uh, whenever people are, are seeing things that they do differently. So today, um, cases, uh, a few disclosures from, from my end, nothing really relevant um, to, to our talk today. Um, so we talked about our learning objectives. So we'll hop into the case. So, so this is, uh, is kind of how I walk through a case um, that comes into my clinic. So step one is going to be finding out what are they here for. Um, and so usually we'll look for an indication, um, you know, hopefully the referring provider putting a good indication on the referral. And in this one, I see I have a 35 year old female. Um, she has acute on chronic atraumatic right shoulder pain. Um, she was seen by one of our orthopedic PAs. Uh, X-rays were performed and there was a calcification noted on the X-ray. And so she was sending for a, uh, an ultrasound to evaluate the rotator cuff as well as the um, presumed symptomatic calcification. So step two is going to be review available imaging. And so this is a really important step. And sometimes people, uh, you know, get really excited to go do the ultrasound and see the patient. And, uh, and this is, is a step that can get missed at times. And, um, and, and it should never get missed. It's really important. And Doug brought this up last time, but you know, if you have radiographs, you know, get them, review them. Uh, and if there's other imaging, look at it too, because it can really save you a ton of time uh, on the front end if you, if you go in uh, with, your, with your eyes open by what's already been done. So in this case, we have shoulder x-rays. We already knew that. Uh, that was part of the referral. And we can see, indeed, there is a calcification. And so you can start to get information and start to develop you know, your differential diagnosis based on these radiographs. Uh, we can see this uh, somewhat amorphous larger calcification, you know, likely in the supraspinatus here. We know it's in the, in the rotator cuff uh, based on the positioning. And so this is a, an AP uh, view. We can see greater tuberosity. It's going to be here. Um, other things that we're going to look for, you know, certainly the location of this. Um, we're going to use all the different views, but we get a somewhat of a sense that this sets more anterior versus posterior just on the radiograph. So that helps whenever you're um, going in to do your ultrasound. Uh, you can also look for other things, right? So we know there's not uh, any significant degenerative disease of the joint here. Um, and then we also know, uh, and one of this is one of the more important things just to recognize is, you know, where this calcification lies. Is it in the rotator cuff or the bursa? So sometimes we'll see this that's sitting down here. Um, and we know just based on the radiograph that this is already uh, erupted into the bursa and is now, um, you know, in that space because the cuff is going to insert here, you know, not down here. And so those are all really helpful things to get um, that you get a lot of information just off one picture. Uh, just a companion case here. This is a, a pet peeve of mine, but we'll get these not infrequently. Um, this was just a couple weeks ago. We got asked to do a diagnostic ultrasound or evaluate for rotator cuff tear. Um, what do you think the answer was? right? It's, you know, if the rotator cuff needs to live in this space here, um, you know, there's not any space here for it to live. And so this is the same as getting, uh, you know, an, 
an x-ray of the knee with grade 4OA and then, you know, ordering an MRI for a meniscal tear, right? It's just it's a waste of time. Um, and this is another example of something that you might see. And again, it's, it's, it's quite common. These things come in. This was an elderly patient, couldn't raise their arm up well, it hurt. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we already know what's going on here. This person has rotator cuff arthropathy. They've got all the sclerosis. They've got lack of, uh, of distance between the uh, head of the humerus and the acromion, they've got degenerative changes. Um, and so, so advanced imaging in these cases, um, you know, often is not, is not required. All right, so, so we looked at our imaging, uh, we, we looked at our referral, and now we need to figure out what's our scanning protocol gonna be. And so, um, so I have a few different scanning protocols depending on, on what the clinical question is. And so I encourage all of you to, to have at least, at least a scanning protocol in your head, um, if not written out, and, and how you're gonna approach some of these problems. And so for the shoulder, um, oftentimes we're doing a, um, you know, a complete exam of the, of the shoulder region. Um, that's really the rule here. There may be times whenever people have very specific questions, you know, say there was an MRI that was already performed and now there's a specific question about a dynamic process or something like that. Then in those cases, I will do uh, limited exams, just trying to answer those questions. Um, but by and large, we're typically doing um, what would fit for a complete exam of the shoulder region. Now a complete exam of the shoulder region doesn't necessarily cover every possible structure in the shoulder region either. And so you can see that this is kind of my standard required images, and this fits the bill for a complete exam of the shoulder. Um, but then there's a handful of other things that I may or may not do depending on the, on the clinical scenario. So, you know, everybody that comes in with shoulder pain is not necessarily getting a detailed evaluation of their pec tendon. You know, I may not be doing a sternoclavicular joint uh, eval, and everybody who comes in with uh, you know, with, with typical shoulder pain where I want to look at the rotator cuff, you know, certainly not imaging the, the lat and everybody. Um, but, but these do come into play for certain, for certain scenarios. So what we're going to go through is, is basically these images here, uh, and we're just going to go through one by one and how I would document these. And so uh, there's different ways to do this, but typically I would say, um, I mean, when I first started, all of my studies had like 10,000 pictures associated with them. Um, and, and that's difficult to actually go back through and navigate those images. And it makes the people uh, managing your pack system upset when you're dumping over that much. Um, so I think being efficient in the number of images that you're, that you're saving is probably a good idea. And that's something that I've tried to work on uh, over the years. And it gets hard to do, but, but I think Think having some good representative images um, and probably not more than you need um, is, is something that I found helpful. And so um, I always start at the biceps tendon. I have the patient lying down um, on their back, usually head of the bed up a little bit. Um, their uh, palm's going to be supinated and we want to orient off the bicipital groove. And so in this case, uh, we can see the biceps tendon sitting here within the groove. I usually like to have an image somewhat like this that delineates the bony morphology. So here it's pretty clear um, where we're at. And, uh, and then here's the, uh, the biceps tendon, uh, which looks pretty normal, uh, no sheath effusion. Um, for, for the purpose of this, I have labeled everything up um, ju just so people can see. I, I typically wouldn't label everything to this degree on my images. And so the, in the labels down here are the ones that I would have. Uh, and then I may put some annotations and arrows on important findings. Um, otherwise, you know, all this stuff you see up here probably wouldn't come through on the images. Uh, I usually will then follow the biceps up a little higher and get a view towards the intraarticular portion uh, of the biceps as well. And so usually if everything's normal, I get two short axis views, one in the groove uh, and one up at the rotator interval. Um, here we can see the subscap and the supraspinatus and we're already starting to see some interesting stuff over here. And so my, my pearl here would be to, to not get too excited. Um, we, know, we already know this is gonna be the area that we're gonna wanna look at. So I usually save that for last so that I make sure I get through all the rest of my imaging. I do my same protocol every time so I don't, uh, so I don't forget to do something and get all excited about the pathology that I'm seeing. Uh, next, we'll move to a long axis view. You should always try to get orthogonal views of all your structures. Um, you can take this long axis view if it's normal, you know, wherever you want. This one's a little bit higher, um, right, as it comes out of the intraarticular portion. You could certainly get one down at the muscle tendon junction uh, as well as you want. Um, you know, you, you can take a couple, but I think if, if there's nothing really suspected, uh, one normal view here, here I think is reasonable. 
Uh, so after the biceps, I then will move to the subscapularis tendon. Um, so the patient's going to be an external rotation uh, at this point. I usually like to use the coracoid as a nice bony landmark to orient. Uh, and if that can be included in, in the image, I think that's helpful. Uh, one, in case you forget to label here, then it's quite clear uh, which, which directionality you're looking at. Uh, and then also ends up putting you pretty much in line with the long axis of the subscapularis tendon. And so uh, we can see lesser tuberosity here subscaps inserting uh, coming down to the myotendinous junction. So again, normal appearance of the subscap. Um, if the patient had some mechanical symptoms um, that you were concerned about potential uh, biceps instability, then this may be a time to do uh, an assessment of biceps stability, um, looking for any subluxation or dislocation um, uh, through or above uh, the subscap. Um, as well as potential for uh, subcoracoid impingement um, if, if there was a uh, uh, clinical suspicion of those diagnoses. Uh, then we'll get a short axis view, uh, again, of the subscap. So trying to label uh, superior inferior, I think, is helpful here, um, so just for orientation uh, purposes. Uh, and again, we can see subscap short axis on the lesser tuberosity. So, so that was normal, um, just include two normal images, and then we move on. From the subscap, I'll move up to the uh, AC joint. And so this is a, is a pretty pretty normal looking AC joint, which is fairly uncommon um, in my practice. Uh, you see a lot of uh, abnormalities at the AC joint, oftentimes which are asymptomatic for folks. Um, but the things we're gonna look at here uh, we're going to look look at the bony margins. So we're going to see, you know, is there any irregularity, spurring? Are we seeing fragmentation, you know, suggestive of uh, distal clicker osteolysis? Uh, we want to look at the capsule. Do we see distension? Uh, do we see any free fluid? Um, typically, we'll put, we'll put the Doppler on to see if there's any Doppler flow um, around the, the capsule as well. Uh, and then we'll often get a um, uh, an orthogonal view here as well, and this is this is the view that we'll often use for uh, for injections. And so this is just showing kind of the um, actually inside of the AC joint. So this is anterior to posterior, shooting right down between the uh, acromion and the clavicle. And here we can see you know very calm uh, AC joint. There's no free fluid, no capsular distension. Capsule looks good, um, no evidence of prior trauma. And uh, and so this is an area where uh, I typically will like to include a little information in my report, um, given how common a, uh, abnor abnormal findings are here, I usually will make some comment if the patient had pain with, with um, you know, transducer pressure there. If they have significant abnormalities, we might do some dynamic testing uh, just to confirm stability and such. Um, but luckily, in this case, things look pretty normal, um, so we were able to move on. Uh, at this point in my protocol, I'll have the patient lie on their side, so they usually um, roll up away from me, and then that gives uh, good access to the posterior musculature. So, so at this part, really what I'm looking at is, is doing a muscle eval, and so I like to uh, get a nice view of the infraspinatus and teres minor muscle bellies. Um, with the, uh, the deltoid then overlying the back. And so here we're really looking at both the size and the echogenicity to characterize any evidence of fatty infiltration or atrophy of the muscles. And so um, the teres minor um, can serve as a control muscle when it's normal um, in comparing echogenicity with the infraspinatus, um, or it's not uncommon to note isolated teres minor um, uh, fatty infiltration and, and potentially atrophy as well, uh, perhaps from a subclinical uh, quadrilateral space syndrome. So just a few a few points on uh, muscle evaluation of the cuff. And so, um, you know, the orthopedic surgeons often like to use this as a reason not to get ultrasound. Um, and, and despite there being multiple publications, um, even in their own, uh, on their own journals, um, a lot of times they continue to propagate uh, this information. And so, you know, depending on the patient, if you have a patient that, that that's, that's image is very suboptimally, they're obese with diabetes, and, and otherwise, um, you know, who, who are probably not current surgical candidates anyways, but, um, but you know, MRI may, may hold some advantage in those cases. Um, but by and large, uh, evaluation of fatty infiltration in the muscles is not overly challenging. And this is, um, is kind of the grading scale that's, that's typically been reported and used. And so um, you can use uh, both echogenicity and architecture, um, simply being able to discern the, uh, the intramuscular tendon and the pinnate pattern um, is, is pretty 
pretty easy. Um, and so you can see if we go back, you know, we can clearly see intramuscular tendon here. We can clearly see uh, the pinnae pattern. And here, the infraspinatus just starts to get whitewashed. And so it becomes hyperechoic. You start to lose the ability to distinguish um, that, that central tendon. And then you can see the difference between the muscles uh, surrounding it. So, so typically using a grade zero, one, or two uh, provides good information uh, and, and is actually relatively straightforward. And the literature has shown has pretty good um, reliability. So after I do my muscle evaluation, then uh, I will get uh, a view of the teres, uh, teres minor. Um, it's pretty rare to have isolated teres minor uh, issues, but you will see things here from time to time. I've, I've had some interesting cases of, you know, isolated calcific tendinopathy of the teres minor. So you should, uh, you know, be comfortable imaging this tendon separate. This is a hard tendon to image, uh, and I see a lot of people will struggle uh, and actually end up getting a view of the inferior infraspinatus instead of actually the teres minor itself. And so the way that I will find this is I will start in this view here of my short axis, and I will follow this out uh, laterally towards its insertion. And then once I get towards the insertion, then I'll, I'll, I will uh, rotate my transducer to get this long axis view. And you can see the, uh, the teres minor is a, is a little bit shorter, stouter, smaller tendon through here. Uh, this is what it should look like. It looks quite different than the infraspinatus tendon uh, and its insertion is quite separate. And so, um, so, so using that trick in short axis and then rotating will, will help you be able to identify this well. Uh, from there, then we'll slide superior uh, and then visualize the infraspinatus. And so I usually like to have a view of, the, uh, of the, the muscle with the central tendon. Again, this you can see the nice pinnate structure of the muscle here coming down onto the central tendon of the infraspinatus. And again, this helps you uh, in making that call for any fatty infiltration. And then we'll follow this out a bit towards the insertion on the greater tuberosity. Um, at this point, posteriorly, I'm still predominantly looking at the muscle. Um, I will get a view of the tendon here, but this is not my infraspinatus tendon evaluation. And so um, the infraspinatus and the supraspinatus really should be thought of as, as one tendon. It's the continuity of the rotator cuff at that point. Uh, so I like to evaluate that um, really starting at the front at the rotator interval and working back and considering it as one structure as opposed to trying to piecemeal it together uh, with a separate view of the infraspinatus here and then moving towards the supra. So, so I'll get a view here, um, but I'm, I'm not going to get too excited and if I start to see stuff I'm going to characterize it uh, later. So from there I'm going to come back and get a view of the posterior glenohumeral joint. So here we have the humeral head, the glenoid, the labrum, uh, and again the musculature over top. Uh, we want to look for any effusions. Um, you know, in a sports practice, it's pretty common to see uh, things like hill sacks lesions here. You know, irregularities. You might see some less uh, or some more subtle irregularities uh, consistent with internal impingement back here, uh, where you may be getting some contact uh, in some of your overhead athletes. And so, you know, there's a variety of things that you're going to look for on your usual scanning uh, protocol. If you are looking for effusion and you don't see it here, uh, you may consider moving your transducer just a bit inferior. Uh, um, towards the uh, actually recess where you may see some fluid um, that is collected at that point. Um, but for our patient here, going to humeral joint looks pretty good. Then we will slide, uh, just make a slight rotation of our transducer to bring this the spinal glenoid notch into view. And so here we just uh, are, are a little bit um, back posterior, slight rotation, and now we have the glenoid that we saw before. Here's the labrum again, humeral head, and then now here's our spinal glenoid notch. And so we look uh, for any space occupying lesions in here. Uh, as, as you know, um, the neurovasculature runs underneath uh, the ligament here. And so particularly labral tears um, can come back and end up getting a, a cyst in this region. Um, and, and that's something that we'll, we'll always look for, particularly in our overhead athletes. So after spinal glenoid notch, then I like to look at the suprascapular notch. And so for this, uh, we simply come up to the spine of the scapula, and then we um, just bring our transducer just over and shoot down um, through the trap and through the supraspinatus muscle uh, and get this nice contour of the suprascapular notch. This is the same general principles as the spinal glenoid notch, uh, again, looking for any space occupying lesions here uh, that may be compressing on the nerve. Uh, we, we do also get a long axis view of the supraspinatus muscle here, uh, so you can start your muscle assessment at this time. 
uh, will then turn into the short axis at the same level. So we're still here. We just flip the transducer and short axis. And I like, I prefer the short axis for making my muscle evaluation. And so this is the same as we talked about for the infraspinatus. We want to see that we can appreciate the uh, tendon, pinnate pattern, and this should completely fill the fossa here uh, between our two bony landmarks. And so this is a normal healthy appearing uh, supraspinatus. Uh, if we start to see atrophy, that we'll, we'll see that this muscle will decrease in size and will not completely fill the fossa. And again, the same thing with the, uh, with the internal um, echo texture uh, that we talked about for the posterior muscles. All right, so now at this point, um, I will have the patient, uh, you know, bring their arm back, essentially recreating a modified crass position. I like to do this with the patient side lying. And so now they're gonna bring their, essentially bring their elbow back into, um, into extension at the shoulder. And so um, gravity is the, going to keep the elbow uh, down. And so recreating that modified crass position without having to, to fight and struggle with them in, in a typical seated position. So the first thing you wanna do here, and I always begin my rotator cuff evaluation here in the short axis. I've really come to rely on the short axis um, as my preferred um, uh, imaging and then confirm in the long axis. And so you wanna find the biceps tendon because you need to orient yourself. And so, so we find the intraarticular uh, portion of the biceps tendon, and this ensures that we're seeing the anterior margin of the supraspinatus. Uh, from there, then we will scan posteriorly back through the supraspinatus and then into the infraspinatus. So here, uh, we know we're looking for this calcification. We know it's present because we reviewed the x-rays. And we're, when we can see, here's the calcification we're seeing already in the posterior uh, supraspinatus. Spinatus. So here what I'll do is, is I'll give a, uh, a location of where this sits. And so we're going to measure back from the biceps and that way I can tell um, whoever needs to know that this calcification starts about a centimeter uh, posterior to the biceps. Um, that uh, measurement also lets us know that this is lying within the posterior supraspinatus and extending into the infraspinatus. Uh, so then we want to get better measurements. So then I'll continue to, to optimize my image now for this calcification. So I'll bring my transducer a bit more posterior, still in the short axis. And now we can see that the calcification itself measures uh, just over a centimeter. We can also appreciate that the supraspinatus anteriorly here looks pretty healthy. So we don't see anything that looks concerning uh, for tendinosis or tear. Uh, I will put the Doppler on. The Doppler will help us just identifying um, some of these cases that, that are in the resorptive phase and maybe associated with acute inflammation. Um, then we'll move to a short axis or a long axis view rather. Uh, again, we're gonna get further measurements. So I like to know how big this calcification is. Uh, so now we can see, you know, it's about a centimeter by, about a, centimeter by a little over a centimeter um, by, by not quite half a centimeter uh, in dimension. So now we have a good dimension of the calcification. Um, um, here, obviously, we would scan the, uh, the supraspinatus in its entirety, um, you know, and you may want to do you know, document normal image a bit anterior to this, uh, and then you can come back into the infraspinatus as well, um, just to make sure there's no associated uh, tears or other pathology. Uh, we're also noting the subacromial bursa at this level, and so here, um, we really don't see any significant bursal thickening or... Um, or bursal fluid, um, which, which is actually somewhat surprising. Oftentimes in these cases of large calcifications, you will see some associated bursitis, um, but here things actually look, uh, look relatively calm. So, so we've got calcification uh, in terms of describing this or what it is. Uh, we know this, this looks like the typical calcium hydroxyapatite deposition. Um, it really is an amorphous calcification. Uh, we, we always will comment on shadowing because the shadowing is going to help us in determining um, you know, how hard this calcification is. And, um, and, and we can see uh, you know, differences in shadowing. And so we'll um, you know, see in this instance here, we see a little edge shadowing coming off, but by and large, we can see um, through the majority of this, which would uh, be pretty typical for some of these softer calcifications. And this is what our case looked like. If we click back, you know, we can actually see through this pretty well. We can still see all the normal bony contours deep. So that helps us um, when we're trying to determine the consistency of this calcification. The other thing we wanna consider um, is, is it symptomatic? And so when 
one of the main reasons for, for being symptomatic is going to be either the mass effect, so it's getting in the way. And so we'll get to our dynamic assessment in a second here, but here's some just examples of that, um, you know, trying to do a dynamic study where we see this large calcification is just not moving. Um, this is a different one where we actually see it move just fine, uh, and this was an asymptomatic calcification. Um, the other reason for being symptomatic may be inflammation. So these can, um, can resorb, they can then leak into the bursa, uh, and you can get really nasty uh, calcific bursitis associated with these. And that's part of the reason for looking at the, um, at the bursa as well as the Doppler flow. So here's our, um, I apologize for the cine loop is not the highest quality, but here's our um, you know, lateral impingement testing. And so this is our usual um, you know, shoulder abduction. We're visualizing the acromion here. Here's our little calcification. And we can see the patient actually clears this pretty well. Um, and we really, um, we'd like to see maybe a bit more humeral depression, but we really don't see a significant amount of, uh, of impingement signs that we would normally see. Um, so at that point, what we want to do is look a little bit further medial at the uh, coracochromial ligament. And so we want to visualize the coracoid. You can get a nice view of the CA ligament uh, going towards the acromion here, and then your rotator cuff is going to live underneath this area. So this is a normal view of what it should look like. Uh, and this was our patient um, just at rest. And then we ask, uh, we ask her to then bring her arm up into abduction, which was a, her painful movement. And we could see that the CA ligament actually tense. And so we can see it come up and we can see the calcification now coming underneath. And so indeed she does have uh, dynamic impingement, um, but it was not appreciated at the acromion, but it's a bit more medial at the CA ligament, which is a common area um, to, see, uh, to see this problem. Uh, here's another uh, a grainy slow cine loop, which I apologize for, but we'll see as we move dynamically. Here's the CA ligament again. This is the coracoid. And we're going to see as she comes into abduction, uh, the rotator cuff is going to come into view with the calcification underneath. And then we'll begin to see some tenting of the, uh, of the CA ligament, uh, which is going to co correlate with pain. We can actually see she's trying to rotate her arm a little bit to try to cheat this thing around um, best that she can. And then we start to see the calcification come in here uh, at the end and tent the ligament. So, so external impingement, um, the, the usual stuff that you guys are used to seeing uh, are gonna, is going to be these findings out laterally. And so here's the acromion. You know, as, as this patient brings their arm up uh, into abduction, we're seeing fluid uh, accumulating. So this is essentially fluids getting, uh, no, that's not playing, fluids getting milked out uh, of the bursa laterally here. Um, so that's a very common finding. And in this, we're seeing bunching of the subacromial bursa. So we can see this thickened bursal tissue that's getting actually caught uh, at the acromion and bunching up and resulting in pain. So these are the things that we usually talk about uh, with, with external impingement. Um, but don't forget to look at the CA ligament because sometimes this will be the only area that you may find this. And so this was a companion case of a young, uh, young teenage volleyball player uh, who came in with shoulder pain uh, and had, I think, three MRIs, um, just wasn't getting better. Um, nobody knew what was going on, was unable to play. Um, and her ultrasound was entirely normal except for this. And so we can see, uh, again, here's her CA ligament. As she comes up into her painful overhead position, uh, we can see the tenting of the ligament and, as well as on the cine hue here. Uh, what was interesting in this case is I was actually able to completely correct this by simply stabilizing her scapula. And and so this was, was very helpful to show the patient and her mom that all the, the physical therapy that everyone had been talking about um, actually could make a difference here. And I think this was really a, a moment where, uh, where they bought in to the whole idea of doing physical therapy um, and, and not, not being told there's nothing wrong with her shoulder. She should go do physical therapy, but it actually showing her there was something wrong with her shoulder, uh, but the, the, the fix was not surgery. It actually was physical therapy. Um, so this can be very helpful, but, but don't forget the CA ligament view. All right, so last thing here, then we'll finish up. So, so what are we gonna say about this? How do we report the findings? And so uh, there's different ways to do this. Uh, I, I encourage everyone to have some sort of template um, so that you can work from. And so this is the way that I do it. And so some of this stuff is blown into my note automatically. So we use Epic um, here. And so I have templates set up. 
And, and a lot of this stuff is, is nice for me. So encounter date comes in automatically, uh, the orders, uh, associated diagnoses, all these stuffs get blown in. So I don't have to worry about that. Referring provider gets blown in um, as well. Uh, we'll have our indication. Um, I always put the study type. So is it a complete or a limited or follow-up exam? Uh, I recommend putting what ultrasound uh, unit you used as well as which transducers um, were used during the study. You know, sometimes these, these are going to be present on your image and so you know that it may be redundant so it's up to you to decide how important it is to have those here uh, we want to have the location obviously the laterality um, I like to put any comparison studies and so if I looked at any x-rays or MRIs I'll typically put those uh, on the report here as well uh, in my finding section particularly for the shoulder I have this templated off so everybody can know exactly what I looked at and what I found and so we can see the long head of the biceps I simply state it's intact it's where it should be uh, and there's nothing wrong with it and so so I'll put those some people will just put unremarkable um, some people may just not put anything at all uh, and just report the positive findings but I do think it's helpful to have at least some running list of what you looked at so somebody knows both from a billing and coding standpoint but also uh, the referring provider knows that indeed you did look if the if the question if there's a specific question right there's a question you know is the biceps unstable um, then even if it's completely normal you definitely should at least at that point say specifically uh, you know answer their question and say um, you know the biceps was stable no evidence of instability something to that regard um, same thing here so subscap is intact normal AC joint same thing looks good um, infra teres plenty humeral joint we just kind of list them off with, with sort of the normal language here uh, then we get to the supraspinatus and so say there's an amorphous calcification uh, I say where it's located so it's posterior to the biceps about a centimeter I say how big it is uh, let them know that there's minimal posterior acoustic shadowing, again, suggesting this is a soft calcification, um, really not much flow on Doppler. I don't see any associated tears. The muscle looks really good. Uh, subacromial bursa actually looks so surprisingly normal. And then impingement testing, um, I talk about tinting of the CA ligament, uh, which resulted in pain, um, consistent with her pain and consistent with impingement. So uh, in my summary, we have uh, right supraspinatus calcific tendinopathy. Um, I, I don't bring all the details down into this part and I just say there's impingement at the CA ligament. And then there was a specific question about an associated rotator cuff tear. And so I will answer that question specifically down here in the summary that no, there is no evidence of a rotator cuff tear. So that's my report. Um, and that's how I typically will, uh, will, will go through a shoulder exam. All right, any questions uh, that folks have about this case or about general uh, approach to you know, reporting or anything else? Hey Derek, <clears throat> this is Doug Hoffman. That was awesome. Um, I just have one comment and then one question. I, I just want to emphasize the whole uh, evaluation of muscle and muscle fatty replacement and atrophy because we get those from our surgeons. Uh, again, with the misconception that you need an MRI to do that. Um, and then the other comment with that would be that teres minor is the most common asymptomatic uh, denervated muscle seen on uh, routine MRI. So just, just be aware of that. My, my question is, is it's really common to see fluid within the tendon sheath of the biceps tendon. Um, you want to comment on that, Madeira, and how you handle that in your report? Yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, and it depends on, on how much fluid and, um, and what the clinical scenario is. But, you know, in some regards with these reports, um, we're reporting what we see, right? And then, and then you have to decide how much extra you want to put into that. And so usually, you know, if there's fluid, I'm going to say there's fluid. Uh, I'm going to say how much fluid there is. So is there, a, you know, a small amount of fluid um, you know, that's, that's just on the underside of the tendon and the dependent portion, you know, then I might add something like, you know, physiologic amount of fluid. Um, you know, I will always comment on if there's associated Doppler flow. Um, and, and if there is any fluid, I will. Um, state if it's painful with with transducer pressure or sonopalpation um, you know I'll comment on if it's displaceable or compressible um, you know trying to get at is this you know is this truly tenosynovitis uh, is this just a physiologic amount of fluid or is this a glenohumeral joint effusion and so that's part of your 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 um, your task here is trying to sort through that the best you can within the confines of an imaging exam but recognizing 
you know, since ultrasound's dynamic, you actually can can figure a lot of this stuff out, um, you know, easier than you can just if you're, if you're reading an MRI, you have to just say what you find. Um, but here you can add a few of these different things. But but if you do see something, um, you know, and, and if I think it's not really applicable, then I may give a little bit of further information. Or if I think it's the deal, right, um, then I'll provide that information as well and say it hurts. Um, there's Doppler flow around it, you know, and then then call that out as tenosynovitis. Any other questions anybody have? Um, for those of you still on, just a reminder that this is posted on the AMSSM YouTube website. Um, you know, for anybody to review in the future. I mean, Derek, that was really, really very good, top notch. Um, so we'll 